Good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. It's been a busy weekend for the worship team. Uh, we started Friday night at Eastern Gate House of Prayer, uh, interceding for um, the young ones and the people caught in sex trafficking and for <coughs> the hearts of man to turn away from pornography and prostitution. Um, and uh, intercession, prayer time, Friday night for those who can make it, it was great. And then last night we went up to Ankeny to Heartland, um, Heartland Church and participated in their 12 hour prayer burn yesterday. So it's going to be in our home again today. I'm excited to worship the Lord together and uh, just kind of eat the fruits of the weekend, so to speak. And uh, we'll open up with any prayer requests or any testimonies this morning. Yeah, Peter. So uh, last week, uh, Jamie got home from church and she, her cell phone wasn't there. She knew she had, had a stack of stuff. And anyway, long story short, I, I came back here and um, thank the Lord, you know, just had wisdom and was praying about where to go. And it was laying in the middle of the parking lot. It hadn't gotten run over by anybody. It hadn't even gotten scratched up. So, you know, and, and thankfully none of the neighbor kids had come along and just picked it up. So, so that was awesome because uh, we could, couldn't afford to really replace that right now. And so, so that was the first thing. Second thing, um, I picked up a check of some of the stuff I'd sold yesterday, and it's almost enough to pay the house payment this month. So that's awesome. Praise Woo! the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lord. Thank you, Lord. James. So, Cheryl, thank you. Uh, you know that she's waiting.
I'm thankful that he didn't require surgery because he could have, but numerous, I mean, we all prayed for him ahead of time, and when the doctors come in, they were able to set it. He's in a cast, and I'm praying that he has as little difficulties and things go as smoothly as possible in the next six weeks mm -hmm. because then he's got a cast to clear up. So it's um, an inconvenience, but I pray that God works it out so that everything is supposed to be. Amen. 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 Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Tim. Oh, sorry, John. Just a second, Don. Tim. Right. Was it was his humanity that was going to defeat him right. and destroy him? 
They thought, well, just shut up, God. We'll, we'll shut him up and we'll deal with him later. But they didn't know. When they killed him, that undid everything. Yes. Once it happened, they realized we are cooked. Yeah. 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 And, and, yeah. and to encourage everyone, like you're talking about the dream and how there might be bad times coming or whatever, as he is, so are we. Yes. And yes. he gives yes. us his faith. Yes. It's his faith yes. that conquers the devil and yes. does it all. Right. So we have nothing to fear. Right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, that's a challenge for all of us is to yeah. see ourselves in Christ. Right. And the same thing he had to overcome was, you know, the doubters and the yeah. questions. Yeah. But he kept going back to the Word of God. Yes. And if we would look at the Word of God yes. the way he did, yeah. as a way of identifying Where am I? ourselves, yes. rather than there way, am I. you know, condemning ourselves. Right. Yes. Our faith would rise as yes. well. That is and true. what Don said is so true. It's our faith. In his faith, actually. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's trusting in him to have completed everything. Yeah. So the focus is always him, but it's it's even the focus of him in us. Yes. And our identity in Christ that makes us overcome. Yes. That right. makes it possible for us to do the works that he did and right. great works as well. So we know yes. the shortcoming of the church is not necessarily our lack of love for God or our belief in God. But our belief in who we are yeah. in Christ. Exactly. That that's what the devil always comes against. Right. To focus on our failure, our 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 soul realm, you know, rather than who we are spiritually. Yes. And Amen. Jesus was filled with the Spirit of God. Yes. But he was a man operating yes. under that kind of anointing. Yes. Not yes. of God, as God said. Yes. He wanted to be God. He could have he could have sure. activated his God authority at yes. any time and called out nations of angels and done right. anything he wanted to do. But he kept himself under the authority of God yes. and under the authority of the Spirit. And yes. I think did something that that we're all capable of doing mm -hmm. if we could ever rise to that awareness, to that, yeah. that reality of who we are. And that's what he's provided for us. Yes. It isn't just an escape from heaven you know, or get out of hell free card. It's, right. It's this abundant life here. Yes. 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 Amen. Yeah. You know, the devil showed him the tree and the fruit. Yes. During the temptation, he suffered the same thing Adam and Eve. Yep. Yep. Here's the tree, the fruit. Come on, if you're who you said, eat it. Mm -hmm. You can do it. But he, as a man, resisted. Yeah. Where Adam and Eve gave in, he resisted. And we can't comprehend what he really did to that spiritual kingdom yeah. and Satan had power over it. Yeah. He just absolutely destroyed it. Yes. 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 And if we hide ourselves in him, like Nathan said, yes. in his faith, and all, all of a sudden, when the yes. devil comes against us, we exactly. can say, hey, yeah. you know, beat me up all you want, but exactly. you, you were defeated by whom I believe in. We yes. cut him off right at the yeah. pass there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what Jesus said. He destroyed the works of the devil. How? Yeah. He stripped him of his spiritual power. Yes, yes. The only power he's got now is in the flesh. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yes. You read it. You know, in Corinthians, he, he stripped him of all of that. So he had, at one time, had been a spiritual force, a spiritual yeah. threat. But not any longer. The only threat he is now is to our natural man, yeah. to our flesh. Yeah. As long as we stay operating in the spirit, in faith, He's busted. He has yeah. no. He has no exactly. control. No power from exactly. this. Yeah. Right. You're saying we need to drag him kicking and screaming into the spirit. That's world exactly right. Where we yes. Need to him. Yes. 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 That's right. what he thinks he has. Power. Yes. Amen. Yes. So another way to say this, and this is a vision that I had years ago when I was praying for Darlene, probably 15 years ago, that I'm just seeing something that I've never seen before. So there was this like turret in a castle, this little tiny tower, like think of Rapunzel and this big tall tower. And then there's this one little bridge that goes to it. And there's a door that was locked. And then there's, you know, a woman seated in shackles. And I had, I saw the key that unlocked the door and unlocked the shackles on one side said love or no, I'm sorry. One side said joy, one side said submission. And so uh, obedience it was obedience, joy and obedience. And we hold this key, 
But it's not our joy and it's not our obedience that unlocks anything. It's the joy of Jesus Christ yeah. due, because of his obedience, yeah. his ultimate yeah. obedience. Yes. Obedience is no longer required of us. Right. And he gives us the joy. Yes. And I have always seen the door unlocking, the shackles falling off. If you don't receive the joy, you can't journey out of that place. This little tiny turret, this little tiny turret. And a few years ago, I realized that that's the whole rest of the kingdom out there. Think of like this vast kingdom. And it's this one little tiny, tiny little place. Well, you know what? The enemy is locked in that little turret. He's shackled in his own cage. And there's this whole big kingdom that we have authority over. We reign and we rule and we hold the key to that door and those shackles. Church, we have to go back there and enter that place and shackle ourselves. We do that to ourselves. He has no authority. We have to choose not to go back there. Not to go back to that little tiny place of bondage where our flesh dwells. Because our flesh died with that. But if we choose to leave it behind. And hold fast to the key of his obedience. And the joy of Jesus Christ that comes with knowing that it is finished. Then we have the whole kingdom. And he is locked in a tower. He is locked in the tower. He is shackled and chained because he is defeated. And we all hold that key. He gave every single one of us that key when we became born again. So let's not go back there. Let's not go back there and talk about the locked door and the shackles. And let's not go back there and shackle ourselves and lock ourselves in that little tiny place. Let's enjoy the fruit of the kingdom. In Jesus' name, yeah. in line with everything. Somebody's already said what I've got in here. So so the Lord gave me this. He said, it tells us in John 8, 32, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Yes. Why would Jesus state something like this? <clears throat> when he made this statement, he was talking to Jews that knew the law and memorized the laws. So why would he make a statement to them like that? So simple logic is if you need set free from something, it has you restrained. It has you obstructed or bound. If Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free, there was obviously something that they needed to be set free from. Why did he take the fruit of feeding? Why did he shed his blood? Why did he die on the cross? It's obvious he came to be our Savior, so we make it to heaven. But along those same lines, he came to set us free while living on this earth. Yes. The meaning of Savior alone is rescuer, liberator, and deliverer. So just reading those meanings, liberator, deliverer, what exactly do we need to be liberated or delivered from? It's to, be re- it's to rescue us from the same mindset the Jews had back in the day. It's the law. The law binds. The law kills. The law messes with our mindset. Even Paul said in Romans 3.20, For through the law is the knowledge of sin. Through what is the knowledge of sin? He said the law. Yeah. And in Romans 7, 7, he said, I had not known sin but by the law. He did not know sin by what exactly? The, the law. law. In the beginning, God even uh, didn't even want Adam to know right from wrong. He gave them specific instructions to avoid the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, lest their eyes would be open. The first Adam brought death, the second Adam brings life. If we all know that Jesus is the second Adam, and we all know that Jesus is the second Adam, the law was given, but grace and truth came by Jesus. Goodness, pureness, there is freedom from restraints, freedom from a mindset that has held us back for so many years. The crown of thorns, I've heard Nathan say that, is like a picture. It was placed on Jesus' head to pierce the mindset. He wants us to pierce our mindset and trust in the grace he provided for us when Jesus died and gave it all for us. Please don't misunderstand is what I'm saying is the law is true. I know the law is true, but it is not the truth that sets us free. That's right. right. It will rob you of faith. It makes you self-occupied. 
Romans 8, 1 states, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. As he is, so are we in this world. Yes. Unfortunately, when you turn to the law, you fall from grace. So don't turn to it. Instead, look to Jesus. I said this before, God's heart is not in the law. And if it was, he would not have needed to send Jesus to die on the cross. He upheld, Jesus upheld the true holiness of the law, and he did it perfectly. And he did it for us. The devil never saw the beauty of the death on the cross. He never saw what Jesus' death would bring to God's saved children. Otherwise, he would have fought like hell to avoid the crucifixion. Amen. In this day, the devil uses the law to keep you in hiding, to keep you living from living the abundant life through Christ because he always points you to the law. He points you to you, your shortcomings, your failures. The devil always keeps you bound by you. Tell him to look to the cross. Tell him he's defeated. Tell him, as Jesus is, so am I in the world. Yes. Use truth against his tactics yes. and he will flee from you. Yeah. Look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Because he was obedient and yes. he held all the law. Yes. You are now the righteousness of God through Jesus. Project that truth. Project, project his unmerited favor towards you. Keep your mind conscious of these truths. It is the truth that sets you free. Yes. Amen. 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 that he has made his word known to us this yes, morning church yes. as he is so are we yes. all right anyone else this morning or let's stand and go to the lord oh sheila sorry okay for evelyn as well anyone else before we stand all right let's go to the lord this morning Heavenly Father, thank you. Praise God. Father, we thank you. Ooh, you are so good, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the words of encouragement, the reminders, Lord, that as you are, so are we, Lord. We thank you that you humbled yourself and you lived a victorious life as the Son of Man. Victorious over death, hell, and the grave, over all things, unlocking the kingdom for whosoever will. When we just simply hope and trust in you, Lord, when we receive your faith. And all we need is that mustard seed, Lord, to receive your faith and hope and trust in your faith that you have finished it all. And you have given us the key to the kingdom. That you have given us your joy and you have honored us with your obedience. Jesus. There is so much more than we can think or imagine that you have for us in this life. In this world as the kingdom grows and expands. As we loose the spirit. The spirit of God into this world. To become transformed. lift up the needs and the prayers of your people this morning. We pray for Christina, Lord, that you set her on the path and encourage her. Encourage her to be bold in her faith. And we thank you, Lord, that you're making dreams come true there. Pray for Evelyn this morning, Lord. Let her know that she is loved, Lord. Send your healing power to comfort her and bless her, Lord. For cold this morning, Lord, we lift him up. We thank you, Lord, that you're protecting him even now, Lord, and that you heal those bones, Lord, and that you make a way of peace and strength and wholeness and healing, Lord. Jesus. Jesus. We thank you for the seeds that have been planted this weekend, Lord. The words that have been spoken, the freedom that has come to people lost in the bondages, the addiction of lust, in the hearts of man, that you pluck that out, Lord. And you replace that with your pure love and your pure light, Lord. As we shine your light everywhere we go, Lord, that the darkness flees and the enemy must flee before us. 
Jesus. Jesus. Yes, Lord Jesus. Have your way this morning, Lord. Continue to pour out your wisdom, your revelation, Lord. To encourage us to step forward, Lord, to keep running this race one step at a time. To know that we are not alone. To know that you have a purpose and a plan for each one of us. And together, this body, this precious body, Lord, that you have a purpose and a plan for all of us together. To change this city, to change this nation, and to change this world. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Have your way in this service this morning. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Just a reminder that if you brought a cell phone with you today to please silence them until the end of the service. And uh, anyone interested in helping in the sound booth, please see Michael for rigorous interviews. <laughs> Requirements are that you can breathe, you can hear, you can see. I'm just kidding. Um, anyone, uh, we do need some help back in the sound booth. Michael does a lot with the audio, video, and the stuff online, so um, it is hard to do both. So anyone interested in uh, kind of being part of the worship team or um, you know being our sound technician, please let Michael know, and we'll be happy to start getting you hooked up. You will be trained if you need to. Yeah. Yeah. We'll just. Make it just turn the buttons. We'll tell you what the buttons do. <laughs> All right, let's take an offering this morning. Uh, Toby and Don, you two want to come take an offering this morning?
hot minute for us to kind of all come together. I feel like sometimes we come at this and we have our own idea in our head as to how we want things, which is a normal everyday thing, and then God comes in and he's like, yeah, well, this is how I want it, so this is how we're going to do it. Yeah. And so it takes a minute for us to be like, okay, God, all right, we'll do it your way. And then like, once we got that yesterday, it's just crazy because you just think, oh, well, we get this, we know what we're going, you know, but um, it's a it's a definite was a lesson. But once it came together, ooh, it was amazing. It's amazing. I encourage everybody to come. It's so amazing. You just you just get so much out of it. And, and it's amazing when when God comes into the room or we allow him to come out of us, I guess is what I should be saying. When we allow him to come out of us and we take that that oil
look right at you, Lord. And if I look at my brothers and sisters, I see you, Lord. I see you, Lord. I see you, Lord, and my brothers and my sisters in this room right now. More, Lord. Let your light shine through more through your children. For those who believe, let your light shine more, Lord. I don't care how young you are or how old you are. The light is shining in you. Just let it open. Just like those keys that was talked about earlier. There's another set of keys that unlock the kingdom. And as we were trying and praying about last night to open those keys, to open up the hearts, to open up the kingdom that is holy within you. It's been preached about here for months. When are you going to release the kingdom? You have that kingdom. You have that authority. You have the voice to speak these things. Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. We're not talking about your own life because you have given your heart to the Lord. But today is the day of salvation for those who are not in Christ. For those who don't believe, those who are dying. For those who are dying in this lost world. Will you be a light to them today? When the world sees you, let them see the finished work. Let them see the finished work. Let them not look at a work that is in progress, but let them see the finished work. Let them see the finished work this day.
God. Thank you, Jesus. We celebrate you tonight, Lord, or today. In Jesus' name, Lord. The celebration of life, hallelujah, in Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for being the light of the world. A light into a dark place. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. He said you gave the keys of the kingdom to a revelation. You ask Peter, who, who do men say that I am? And then you ask, who do you say I am? And Peter said, Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. And Jesus said, On that revelation, I'll build a church. And the kingdom of hell cannot prevail against it. And I've given you the keys. Hallelujah. Which tells me this, that without a revelation, those keys are worthless. Keys operate based on us understanding not only who Christ is, but who we are in Him. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. It's time to unlock some locks. Praise God. Set some people free. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless all of you. You may be seated. Thank you for your testimonies, sharing what God has spoken to you. Hallelujah. We've all been blessed already. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Mike, and the worship team. Thank you, Suzanne, for opening. Praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord another big hand clap. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, the Sunday school people can be dismissed. Enjoy. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Amen. God is good. Amen. All the, the words that were spoken and shared have uh, not only been a blessing but uh, to all of us, but they helped me. Amen. Because it's exactly what I want to teach and preach this morning is uh, just kind of an echo of what everyone has already said. Praise the Lord. And so while the, the young ones are going their way, it's interesting. We live in a time when it's just kind of weird. You know, 100 years ago, everybody owned a horse. And only the very rich had cars. And today, everybody owns a car, and only the rich have horses. Praise the Lord. How the stables have turned. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, James, wherever you are. Oh, there he is back there. You know, I, I, I don't know about you guys. I grew up on the westerns, you know, the old, the old westerns, you know, Shane and High Noon and, you know, all those kind of movies. And I, I discovered something over the years that, you know, they'd always have the shootouts in the old west, and they were always based on the, this town's not big enough for both of us, you know. Well, I discovered that there is a, a way that we could have dealt with a lot of the conflict in the Old West if we would have just built the towns big enough for another person. Big enough for both of us, praise the Lord. But then again, we wouldn't have had all the great movies that we saw, so there you go, praise the Lord. All right, well, praise God. Let's uh, get into the Word of God this morning. I want to begin, uh, Sheila, with Hebrews chapter 8 and verses 1 through 5. Hebrews 8, 1 through 5. Now, we've talked about these things before, and uh, we've talked about how Jesus 
uh, is the fulfillment of or the revelation of all of the types and the shadows and the symbols that are in the temple. Everything that's in there is pointing to him and trying to give us an explanation. And the truth is the tabernacle itself or the temple itself. Moses was told to build that thing after what he saw in heaven. Well, what he saw in heaven was Jesus. Otherwise, all the other things wouldn't have been pointing to him. But that's just how they played out in the natural realm. So that's kind of what we're, we're talking about because... Once we understand this, when I was talking Wednesday night, that not only uh, are we in Christ, we are Christ. That's just the truth. That's not blasphemy. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Yes. He has placed us, amen, in Him. Yes. And He is in us. We yes. are one. He's the head. We are the body. That We are Christ yes, we are in this world. Yes. It's just a question of us. The only, the only problem is we haven't identified with that. We still see ourselves as something separate from Jesus. That's the power that moved in Jesus' life was he saw himself one with God. He didn't see any separation there. Even though he was just a man, he saw there was no separation between him and God. And that's how he was able to do what he did. That's how he had the faith that he had. Amen. And that if, if we're to do the same kind of works and greater works, then we're going to at some point have to real, come to the same realization that he came to. Amen. That I and the Father are one. That we and Jesus are one and the same. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's the kingdom that he came to present, amen, the kingdom of heaven on earth. Praise God. So here he says, now of, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. Now this is, I believe Paul, there's arguments about who wrote it, but it's irrelevant as far as I'm concerned. But he's speaking to Jewish people. And he says, now of the things which we have spoken, this is the total. This is the end result. This is what I'm trying to get you to. So everything leading up to this first four books in the uh, uh, the first four chapters in, in uh, Hebrews is all just one letter. You know, we, we know that there weren't chapters and verses and all the things that we have today. It was just a letter, praise the Lord, a continuous writing. So now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of majesty in heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. So they're just types. They're not the reality. They're just trying to point us to something. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for See, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount. Now what we've done, what religious religion has done is basically take the types and make them our religious reality. Right. Instead of getting some revelation about what those types are supposed to be presenting. And because of that, it has not only kept us in a religious kind of way of, of thinking and living, but has also diminished our capacity to be who we are in Christ. Right. So you could say Satan has more to do with religion than God ever did. Sure I mean, God didn't plan on a religion. He planned on a, a, an avenue or of approach to him so we could be reunited with him. Even Judaism was for that. It was to bring you to the end of yourself so you'd have to have a savior and recognize that so you could be reunited with God, so you could be redeemed. Amen. So that you could be reconciled. Praise the Lord. So now let's, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 3, and we'll read verses 7 through 11. Hebrews 3, 7 through 11. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. So this particular generation, it grieved the heart of God. And because of that, they didn't enter into his rest. Right? 
Colossians 1 and verse 27. So all those things back there are still talking about a true, a truth that God's trying to reveal. They happened, they were, they were uh, realities historically, uh, but they were still pointing to something that was true, that was greater than just the natural out, uh, results of these people living out their lives. So here it, he says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the rest. Mm -hmm. This is the real rest. Yes. It's not a, you know, God's moved out of the natural temple. Right. And he's moved into the temple that is made of human beings. Right. Amen. And the generation that Jesus spoke to, they only knew a physical, natural That's temple. Right. They didn't grasp the concept of God and them being one or that God would live in them and they could be reunited to God. Amen? So we, let's just, just compare this to the Exodus generation. That's who these people were talking about, right? These are the people that were delivered out of slavery in Egypt. They were delivered how? By the blood of a lamb, right? A type and a shadow of the Lamb's saving blood, yes. the true Lamb. Yes. The second generation was delivered not from Egypt, but from the bondage. And when I say generation here, I'm not talking sequentially or you know genealogically. I'm talking about those and us. Yes. Everybody under this new generation, under the new uh, uh, reality of Christ uh, being uh, released into this earth. Amen. So the second generation was delivered not from physical Egypt, but from the bondage of the law of Sinai and from the bondage of sin and death. Yes. Praise the Lord. Galatians 4, verses 21 through 26. The, I mean, all of this is in here and it's all supposed to come together. It's all supposed to make sense. Well, it doesn't if you're looking at them as isolated, separate, you know, incidences that have no total uh, kind of uh, connection. But nothing in here is written for no is written for no reason. I mean, I know that's a you know double negative there, but still, this is a revelation of Jesus Christ from Genesis to Revelation. The whole thing is about a revelation. It's about a revealing of Him. Now, so just for a second. So then you look in here to find yourself because that's what Jesus did. What do you find? You find Jesus. It's a revelation of Jesus, and that's what he's trying to get us to understand. Yes. When you find yourself in here, you have yes. found Jesus. Yes. Yes. You're one with him. Yes. You are Christ in this earth. Yes. That's not just my theory. That's not just some theology that I've come up with. That's what the scripture is trying to get across to each and every one of us. Yes. It's why Jesus seemed like a blasphemer, because he's saying... Look, I and my Father are one. This is, the, this is the path I'm trying to put you on so you can get to the same place. And they said, blasphemer. He's making himself God. I'm not making me God. I'm not making you God. He did. He, he declared that we were born from above, that we were his offspring, that we are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, that we are looked at from, by God the same as he sees Jesus, accepted in the beloved. He loves us. The scripture tells us he loves us the same as he loves Jesus. Yes. And why wouldn't he if we are Jesus? Yes. Praise the Lord. So tell me you that desire to be under the law. Yep. Have, haven't you heard the law is what he's saying. <laughs> For it's written, Abraham had two sons, one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. Mm -hmm. But he who was born of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. Yeah. But he of the free woman was by promise. Which things? These are an allegory, he says. For these are the two covenants. Again, everything in here is trying to bring out the same truth. Amen? These are the two covenants. This is an allegory. The allegory is there's two covenants. And we're using this woman, the bond woman and the free woman as a picture of these covenants. Amen? Which is, so the, the mount, one is from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. That's where the Ten Commandments were given. Right? For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, this is the Hebrew 
reality that's taking place in the, in the earth at the time that there was, this was written yep. and is in bondage with her children. Yep. Yep. Israel. Yep. The Hebrew people. The people that have the law. Yep. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free. Yes. Which is the mother of us all. Yes. So our mother city is the heavenly Jerusalem and she's not a slave to Jewish law. She is free. She's not a bond slave. She is free. Praise the Lord. We are birthed from that mother, if you want to use that analogy. So we were born free. They were born into slavery. We were born free. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So to us who are of the Jesus generation, it's clear that the bondage we've been delivered from is the law. Praise the Lord. We've been redeemed from its curse. We've been called out and delivered from that system of bondage, of laws and regulations, and we've been brought out from that, we've, we've been delivered from that system by the blood of a spotless lamb. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. That first generation, all the sacrifices they made were pointing to the one sacrifice that would never, you'd never have to think about sacrifice again. Amen. Their sacrifices forced them to think about the next one that was coming because as soon as they got their, their uh, uh, resolution of the last uh, sin, they would walk away free, but only they, they wouldn't get five feet from the altar before they were guilty of failing again under the law, which meant that the, the, the sacrifices were constantly on their minds, as was the sin, because they know I've got to have another sacrifice, amen, or I'm going to be dealt with. Praise the Lord. So that first generation saw a rock that was smitten by Moses as they traveled, amen, through the wilderness, right? The second generation saw the true rock, Christ himself, amen, who was smitten for our sins and our iniquities, the true rock. Picture reality, amen, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 4. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. They didn't know it. Some people today don't even realize it. But that is the rock that they were drinking from. It looked like a big boulder with water coming out of it, but it was Jesus. It was something pointing to a greater reality. Amen? So the first generation, they fed on manna that just fell down from heaven. Right? The second heard Jesus say He was that bread that had come down from heaven. Jesus. Picture? Yes. Reality. Yes. The first generation saw a serpent on a pole. Mm -hmm. Why? Because They were cursed. The reason they were cursed was because they complained and resisted everything God was trying to do for them. Yep. Amen? So at Moses' command yep. to look on the pole, yep. they received healing. Yep. Yep. Right? Yep. They got delivered from the, from the plague that was sweeping yep. through the camp. All right. In the New Covenant, the second generation, look at John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. John 3, 14 and 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life, eternal life. Praise the Lord. So the first generation saw the Ark of the Covenant. They saw it go into the Jordan River on the shoulders of the priests. And as they passed over, they came into the Promised Land. The second generation witnessed the true Ark of God. See, we want to, we always end up trying to mathematically equate this thing, and it doesn't work that way. Because he's the candelabra, he's the candlestick in the holy place, he's the table of shoe bread. Right? He, he's the altar of incense. He's the, the sacrificial altar. He's the bra, brazen labor out in the outer court. He is the Ark of the Covenant that's inside the holy place. He's everything that's in that Ark. He's the temple, amen, that all of that stuff is in. He's, all things are Him. He is all. All comes together in Christ. And that's the picture He's trying to get across to us, amen? So the first generation saw the Ark coming across on the priesthoods shoulders into this promised land. The second generation witnessed the true ark of God 
as John the Baptist drew him into the Jordan to baptize him, amen, and declare Jesus to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, which was the point of getting to the ark because that was the mercy seat. That's where the high priest would go once a year and offer up the, the, the sacrifice or sprinkle the blood from the sacrifice onto that uh, ark of the covenant for the atonement of all the sins of Israel for another year. Praise the Lord. So Jesus is the only way into the promised land. Yes. There isn't some other way. There isn't multiple ways. There are but one way. Praise yes. the Lord. Right. The land promised was not real estate. Right. The land that they were looking for, amen, was Jesus himself. Jesus Lord. All of the promises God made to the fathers were fulfilled in Christ. Amen. Yes. All right, he, go back to Hebrews again, if you will, Sheila. Hebrews 3, uh, verses 7 through 12. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart. They have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Failing to enter into Christ. Finding, trying to find some other avenue, some other way of doing this stuff. Amen. All right. Let's look at Revelation chapter 2. Verses 12 through 17. Now, while that's coming up, uh, most of these books in the Bible were written sometime around 40, 50, maybe even as, uh, as late as 60 uh, A.D. Most of them were written before the destruction of the temple, which took place around 70 A.D. Now, some of, that, some of these books were written during that time, or the the letters that were written to the different churches. The book of Revelation, however, was written around 90 A.D., which means it was about 20 years after the destruction of the temple. So the Jews no longer had a temple that they could use as an alternative resource, right. if you will, to Christ. But there was still the struggle within the, 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 what you, we would call the New Testament church or the New Covenant reality about how much of that law and how much of freedom do we really have? Even though they didn't have the temple anymore, there was still a struggle within these people because the vast majority were Jews to begin with. Right. And those that weren't were influenced by the Jews, yeah. amen, who had been converted. And many of them, we say converted, but they were still struggling. You read it in almost every book of the yeah. Bible in the new, under the New Covenant, in the New Testament, where they're bickering about... Yeah. Well, how, much, how far do we got to go? How far can we go with this? I mean, how, don't we still have to do certain things? And, and that's 90% of what Paul's writing about is trying to rebuke all of that uh, historic way of trying to approach it and the mixture that was the result of it. John, when he's on the Isle of Patmos, is still dealing with the same thing. He's writing to churches throughout, you know, the, the world, uh, the known world at the time, and he's dealing with the same stuff. Now we've kind of, the religion has kind of made this thing a whole bunch of other stuff. And I'm not saying there aren't parallel stuff going on here and things that, to look to. But at the same time, he's dealing with a pragmatic truth, a reality that he's trying to, to deal with, amen, which is this, this mixture of Judaism and Christianity. Yep. This old covenant and new covenant. And that's mostly what we're looking at in the book of Revelation. Because again, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. It says right at the beginning of the book. Exactly. It's not a revelation of horrible stuff happening in the end times. Some of those things may be realities that will happen, but it's about a revelation of Jesus just as the entire Bible is. Well, it stands to reason if, if we've struggled with the revelation of Jesus throughout the Bible, we're going to have problems understanding the book of Revelation. Yeah. It just by, I mean, logic, right? So here, here we are in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 12. And he said to the angel of the church, now who's speaking? Jesus. Yeah. Right? 
who is the tabernacle, the temple. I was just throwing that in there for extra information. But that's who he is. So Jesus is speaking, and to the angel of the church of Pergamos was right, these things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. In other words, the word of God cuts both ways. You know, it's just, that's, the, that's what that represents is the word of God coming out of his mouth. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. The Nicolaitans, which I won't get into a lot today, but that word simply means hierarchy. And we know, just take a look at the church. It's what Jesus hates is the hierarchy that I'm somebody special and y'all just shut up and listen. And I mean, the Catholic Church for centuries wouldn't even allow people to have a Bible. The Bible was literally changed, chained to the pulpit. It was in Latin, which nobody spake spoke but the priests. Now I'm not just picking on the Catholics because it's it just boiled right over into Protestant Protestantism, praise the Lord. So I'm just saying this is something Jesus hated and it's been going on since day one. Look at what they're bickering. Paul had to deal with people. You, you think you're, you're from this guy and you're from Paul. And I'm telling you, it's Jesus that you're looking to and not this guy that preached that message or somebody that preached that one who pastors this church or does this or that does that. It's about Jesus. Amen. So repent or else I will come into you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth or with the word of God. Didn't Jesus say, I didn't come to condemn. I'm not going to destroy people. This thing will destroy them. Those who haven't yielded to it, who haven't come to Christ, will be judged by this. Yes, they will. Yes. It's the demands. You're either in Christ or you're under the law. Whether you like it or not, that's the reality. So he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. We'll get to that. And will give him a white stone. And in the stone a new name. We've talked about that stone before. But in a new name written which no man knows saving he that receiveth it. Praise the Lord. So you enter the rest. Back to our original goal here. You enter the rest by embracing the word of God. That is quick and powerful. It's alive. Quick. That's what that word means. It means to bring alive. Amen. Quick and alive and powerful. Praise the Lord. So in Revelation, they're receiving the revelation proceeding out of his mouth. They're, they're receiving the word of God. Yes. Jesus, the revelation. Amen. And so as, as they get into this new covenant mentality, they're coming out of the confusion of mixed marriage. They'll no longer walk in the duality of the covenants or struggle with the two natures of Adam and Christ at the same time. No more double-mindedness. No more instability because of that double-mindedness. But they move into the reality of God's promise and receive the white stone, which is a new name and a new identity. Praise the Lord. You're either married to Adam or you're married to Jesus. That's right. That's right. That was their battle. That's what he's talking about here. That's what this symbolism is all about. The fornication. The eating from the table for idols. It's, it's everywhere in the Bible. It's not some new thing that just happens here. He's referring back to all these symbolisms, all of these types and all these shadows that we should have understood so that when we get to the book of Revelation, we know what he's talking about. Because we didn't understand it then, we have no clue what he's talking about now. So we make up all kinds of the weirdest, most outrageous kind of stories. And why? Mostly to scare the hell out of people, to keep them obedient to the church because none of them understood what was going on in the Revelation. So you, you can go through uh, the Christian channels and you'll find 
a hundred different teachings on the book of Revelation and every one of them is just so weird and, and fractured and disconnected that you go, where in the world does that come from? I mean, this is all this up to G Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And then the book of Revelation says a revelation of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And it doesn't fit anything else that we've heard. Yeah. Exactly. So how can that be? Either he's a total schizophrenic and there's like dual identities here that we're not understanding or we never understood all the way through here to get to the place where we could then see a greater revelation or a fuller understanding. Amen. So he that hath an ear, so repent, repent or else I'm going to come quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth saving he that receiveth it. Praise the Lord. All right. Hebrews 10 and uh, verses 3 through 5. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, but in those sacrifices, there's a remembrance, again, made of sins every year. This is what I was talking about just a little while ago. Every time a sacrifice was offered, it just dredged up every fear that I'm going to fail again. I failed before. I'll fail again. I'm going to have to have another sacrifice. There'll be another sacrifice and so forth. So it's not possible that blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. They couldn't do away with them. They can only cover them for a year. So wherefore, when he comes into the world, Jesus, he says, sacrifice and offering isn't not what you were wanting. But a body you have prepared for me. Yes. Praise the Lord. All right. So the new covenant through Jesus, we've been given a new name. Yes. We've been given a new nature. Yes. We're declared not guilty. Yes. Period. By the judge, by the one who will judge all. Yes. He has already declared us not guilty. Not guilty. Yes. And there is such a thing as double indemnity. You cannot be tried for the same crime twice. He's already delivered us. He is not only the judge, he's the mediator, he's the attorney that battles for us. And he's also the sacrifice that, that stands in the gap or takes my punishment for me. And he declares me innocent. So every time the devil comes with a new charge against you, it's a lie. It's him trying to retry you for something you've already been tried for and found innocent. Yes. Praise the Lord. So, he declares us not guilty, giving us the privilege then of eating the hidden manna that he spoke of here earlier, right? That hidden manna was a portion of the manna that fell from heaven, amen, that was kept in a golden pot inside the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies, in the most holy place. Again, all talking about Jesus. Every one of those things is talking about Jesus. Amen. So the ark is Christ. Inside the ark was the unbroken tablets of the law. Remember, Moses broke the first ones because he was ticked off because the people were doing all the stuff that he had just gotten the laws about. Not knowing, I suppose not knowing that this was going to go on for another several thousand years. But nevertheless, he got so frustrated, he breaks the law. God gives him the new ones. Those are the ones that go into the ark unbroken. The tablets were unbroken. They were pristine. Amen. Well... Jesus fulfilled the law, kept all of those, never broke a one. Amen. He frees us from the oldness of the letter of the law so that we can serve in newness of spirit. So the law has no more impact or effect on us whatsoever. We're strictly being led by the spirit of God. Amen. We feed on Jesus. He's the hidden manna. Amen. In Revelation, there were some people we read about here a little bit ago, and they were eating things that were sacrificed to idols. I can tell you most churches have a big altar with a table on it and filled with idol food. <laughs> Praise the Lord that we partook of for a long time. Hallelujah. But God's telling these people in the book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking. The temple, out of the temple, he's speaking. Amen. Telling them to change your spiritual diet. Either eat the words of the sword that's coming out of my mouth or eat the words from the doctrine of Balaam. Yes. 
Praise the Lord. Now, Balaam's biggest failure was being a prophet for hire. Praise the Lord. We don't know anything about those in this generation, do we? Oh, just turn on the TV. He was hired to prophesy a curse on people who were not under a curse. Right. And our tragedy, one of the tragedies that we deal with today is there are still voices among God's people who are not speaking words of power and truth that flow out of rest, out of the finished work of Christ, out of our identity in Him. Instead, they're bringing people under a curse who are not under a curse. Galatians 3, verses 2 and 3. Oh, foolish Galatians, right? This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? This is what we live with in church. Most of us, praise the Lord, you've been born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, and now for the next X number of years until you die, all you're going to hear is about your failures. Yeah. You got to get right. You got to do right. You backslid. You're this. You're that. And it's just on and on and on. A curse constantly putting you back under a curse that you're not, that you were delivered from. And now they come back and preach the law to you every day. So all you hear is, I need another sacrifice. I, I got to pray back through. I got to do this. I got to do something. Amen. Right? Am I right? I mean, come on. That's exactly where we struggle. Amen. For forever. Verse 10. Verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. Yep. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. You're, you'll always be cursed because you'll never be able to keep them all. Yes. We like to pick the ones we want to keep or that we think yes. we can keep and ignore the rest of them. But you're, yes. you're screwed going in because you're going to be held accountable for everything. Yes, you, are. Yes. you know what that means? That means you can't eat bacon. Right, that's right. I'm done. You can't have ham. You can't have... I'm not saying all that stuff is the best for you. I'm just saying, hey, you're going to eat it sometime. And when you do, you get that pizza, the, you know, the, the loaded pizza, you know, the, the house pizza with everything that, you know, that has, we've been told will kill us. Amen. It's, yeah. you know, it's suicide, but it's by degrees, praise the Lord. But the good news is, I may die early, but I'm not going to be judged. But I would be if I was still under the law. Because the law is still in effect. Yes. Now we know this. I was talking to Sarah about this a while back. We know that the law is good. So there's a good reason for him telling us not to eat pork three meals a day, yeah. seven days a week. Because yeah. yeah. it's probably not really going to do you a whole lot of good for longevity. Right? right? Uh, Why? The law is good. It was there for a reason. Yeah. But we break it now. We're not held accountable. I'm no more held accountable, amen, to eating pork. Although there are natural consequences to the, to the breaking the law, there is no judgment from God. And that's the point we're trying to make here. Yes. Praise the Lord. So God's telling them, change this diet. Change the spiritual diet. Praise the Lord. You can draw your own natural conclusions. Sure. I'll leave from that. So, Galatians 3, we've read. And he says, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Why? Because as long as there's a law, you're held accountable to every Amen. I being dotted and T being yeah. crossed and yeah. jot and tittle, as they say in the scripture. You're, you're, held, you're held responsible to keep it all. That's what we have been redeemed from. Yes. That's what they're still struggling with yes. as Jesus comes to reveal himself to yeah. them. To, in the book of Revelation, they're still dealing with this stuff. And we think, well, surely they would have gotten... We're, we're still dealing with it. Come on, I mean, this is 2,000 years later. That was 90 years. This is 2,000 years, and we're still struggling with the same stuff. So every time the law is preached, people are put under the law. Every time the law is preached, they're put back under a curse. 
The table is set with idols food. Double-minded message. In union with Christ and Adam at the same time. Fornication. That's what he's talking about here. I know some of you said you, you in Satan's seat. He said one of my best boys was martyred there. Yeah. Eating things offered to idols. Yeah. Yes. The lies. The putting you back under the curse. Yes. And fornication. The you being married to Christ and being married to Adam at the same time. That's fornication. Yeah, that is. You're not being faithful to either one. So you don't get the benefit of either one. We've, here's the reality. We have been espoused to one husband. Yes. And only one. Yes. Adam's dead. That old man is dead. The yes. law is dead. We yes. are free to yes. marry then whoever we want yes. and not be in fornication. Yes. It's only when we stay married to this guy and still want to marry this guy that it's, it's called fornication. Yes. And that's where much of the church is. Yes. Still hanging on to the law, still dealing with the Adam, the Adamic nature, the, 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 the eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, yes. and still trying to get the benefits of yes. eating solely from the tree of life, which yes. is Jesus. And we keep getting sucked back into this thing, and then we come out, and then we're, we think we're free from that, and we're going to really be faithful to Him now, only to be drawn back into this fornication, into this illicit relationship. That's what Jesus is talking about here. And He wasn't just talking to those people in 90 A.D., any more than he was just talking to the people in 60 A.D. or 70 A.D. when the book of Hebrews or, or Galatians or Colossians or any of the other books were written, he was speaking to us. Yeah. Ephesians 5, verses 25 through 27. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives. You know how, I mean, how many of you have people that just get so aggravated with you because you won't be under law? Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, just, it just aggravates them to no end. I, just as a side, I, I remember women saying when we were in the UPC, which was still, I mean, it was legalism all the way. And I mentioned, I was laughing Wednesday night, it was like devil eggs were sin, you know, <laughs> devil ham. You know, devil food cake. You just all of these weird stuff that people would just blow everything out of proportion and make everything illegal. I'm not saying that was preached everywhere, but I'm just saying that was kind of the mentality. And I remember women saying, hey, where the other deal was, you talk about a, a, a kind of a, you know, male-dominated culture. The preachers... They had their $500, $600 Hickey Freemans or whatever, you know, you know, uh, Brooks Brothers, you know, name some company, and uh, all dressed to the nines and, you know, hair perfectly slicked back and Rolex watches and, you know, all this. And the women couldn't wear a wedding ring, they couldn't wear a watch, uh, you know, ha had their hair, they had to look like they come out of the 1800s, dresses and everything else. Yeah. It was so biased and so wow. hypocritical, you know. And yet I remember women saying, if I get to heaven and find out we could have cut our hair, yeah. I am going to be so off. Yeah. 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 You know? So you know what's going through their minds, and why wouldn't it? Yeah. You know, they're looking on the other side of this thing and thinking, hey, it's all cool for them. Of course, you know, you had to wear long sleeve shirts and keep your top button buttoned and all that kind of bogus. But I'm just saying. I, I can tell you firsthand experience what Jesus is talking about here. Yes. And it's alive and well yes. on planet Earth. And that may be an extreme that I'm talking about, but the reality is still there almost every church that you go to. It may not be the same thing. It may not be exactly, but they're still using they the are. law to manipulate they and are. to control. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself forth, that He might sanctify it, cleanse it with the washing of the water by the Word, that He may pre might present it to Himself a glorious church, 
not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. This is not about a marital, uh, you know, seminar. It's true, but we ought to be submiss submitted one to another. I mean, it can't just be one-sided thing here. But that's the way he's saying it is, this is what Jesus did. This is, again, yeah, there's a reality, there's a truth, but the greater truth is pointing us to Jesus and not to our failed marriage. Yes. Right. Yes. It'll work, but it's, that's the ultimate picture he's trying to paint here is a portrait of Christ. Yes. And not our failed marriages or how we deal with marital stress. We are married to Christ. That is our new name. Your new name is Jesus or Christ. Christos. Amen. That's the white stone. That's what he's giving you. An engagement ring. A wedding ring. And on that stone is the new name. Who you now are in Christ. You are Christ. He tells us that over and over in the scripture. I mean, it's just over, constantly there. Revelation 2, verse 13 again. Revelation 2, 13. It's, you know, it's the old cliche. This is so simple, you need a preacher to confuse you. Praise the Lord. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name. And has not denied my faith. Now, get this. It was just based on what we've been talking about. Okay, Satan's seat is, is where his name and Adam's name, or his name and the law, are being kind of balanced, played back and forth. He said, I know your works. I know where you dwell. Even where Satan's seat is. You're right in the middle of all this stuff, and, yeah. but yet you've held fast my name. You, you, you stayed faithful to your new husband, to your living husband, not the one that's dead. And have not denied my faith. Faith that Don talked about earlier. Not my faith, his faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Okay? The power of Satan and the seed of Satan is revealed in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. Colossians 2 verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. What was that? What was written in the law. Which was contrary to us. And he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. That is where Satan sits. Because every time he comes against you, he's coming against you with the law. Yes, he is. Yes. Condemning. Yes. Judging. The weapon that Satan used, and he still uses today, is the handwriting of ordinances that are against us, which is the law. God isn't writing on tables of stone. He writes on our heart. The old covenant, it was commands and performance. Here's the command. Let me see you do it. The new covenant is Christ's love and sacrifice that we just read about how a marriage is supposed to be. It's about His love, about His sacrifice, and He gives us a white stone and a new name. He sacrifices completely for His bride, even though she is kind of goofy sometimes. But He gives her His name and says, we're now one. And no man can put us under, can separate Colossians, excuse me, Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 through 23. Colossians. That's me trying to do a main accent. Colossians. So blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross thing we just saw that was Satan's seat, if you read on, you'd see that he destroyed that principality. He destroyed that power, that influence. He nailed it to his cross, and that's what we're reading right here. Blotting out 
making them irrelevant. The handwriting of ordinances that were against us, that held us in bondage, amen, which was contrary to us, which is against us. And he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Having spoiled principality. See, he took the weapon, the only weapon Satan has, and he nailed it to the cross. He disarmed him, amen. He made him nothing but just what he could accomplish in the natural. He has no more spiritual power. The spoiled principalities, powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing them over them, amen, in that act. Let no man, therefore, don't let anybody then judge you, yes. amen, in meat or in drink or in respect to a holy day or of a new moon or of the Sabbath days or all that. Come on, you just keep on going. All the things that you can come up with, amen, which are shadow of things to come, but the body of Christ, you couldn't play softball. You couldn't be in inner, inner even uh, co, co, uh, co ed uh, games or, or sports. You couldn't go to a swimming pool. Yeah. Mixed bathing. I've never bathed in a pool, but I get the point. <laughs> but I see more of a woman walking down the street in Des Moines, Iowa in yeah. July than I've seen in swimming pools. Yeah. I mean, it's insane. Yeah. So don't let them. Just don't let them do that. Let no man beguile you of your reward in voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his own soul, and not holding the head, Jesus, from which all the body and the joints and the bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. Wherefore, if you're dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world which we were crucified, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to the ordinances of the world? If you're now a new creature in Christ, if you're now a heavenly being, why do you allow the natural world to hold you dominant, to, to dominate over you? In other words, to give you rules and regulations to, to live by that have nothing to do with who you are. Touch not, taste not, handle not, can't play miniature golf. Putt, putt. At a pre I said this. I had a preacher that said, he didn't even know what it was. But he said, if they had to ask me, I figured it must be wrong. Right. Yeah. So I told him, no, you can't play. Yeah. Touch not, taste not, handle it. Which all are to perish with the using. They're all temporal. Yeah. After the commandments and doctrines of men. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom. They look like you really got some spiritual understanding and some wisdom. In will worship, in soul worship, in my own self. And humility. Uh -huh. I have to say, you know, if you, gotta, if you have to look humble, you ain't humble. Right. I mean, if you're trying to be humble, you're, you've already lost the game. Right. So, and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Doesn't do the flesh any good. It may satisfy, make it feel a little better, but it doesn't help a thing. Only power Satan has is accusation and condemnation. That is it. We're fearful he's going to kill somebody. He's going to give us this. He's going to give. He doesn't have the power to do that. In this world, you will have tribulation. There's a flu virus. It ain't Satan's. He'll make you believe it's his. Praise the Lord. Or make you believe that God gave it to you. My grandson had a sledding accident. Broke his leg. Tammy was talking about it. Wednesday or Friday uh, afternoon. She's like four years old. Hey, the devil was not on that hillside. He was there enjoying fun with his family, with his siblings and with his dad. But he's four years old. And he don't always listen to dad. And he got on a sled when he was supposed to be waiting while dad was putting the other two on another sled. And he took off down the hill and didn't make it all the way. He said he didn't do what dad told him. Dad said, stay in the sled. And he said, I came out of the sled. Praise the Lord. That was not the devil. That was life happening. But we can trust God to see to it 
that he heals, that he's delivered. You say, well, you know, and I prayed. As soon as we heard about it, I said, I prayed. It's not going to be broken. Well, it was broken. And my daughter called me as I was leaving the church uh, Friday night and said, well, it's broken, Dad, but agree with me right now that they're not going to have to do surgery because they said they don't know if they'll be able to set it. It's that bad of a break. And if they have to do surgery, then it just prolongs and there's more danger and more concern and everything else. So we agreed together. And if you see it, I mean, it's, you can see it's broken. I mean, the pictures they took before. And, uh, and fortunately, it, it was set. They, the doctors, in fact, the doctor said it set perfectly. There's no reason to be concerned that there should be any kind of complications or any other concerns. It'll heal. He's four years old, you know, you heal pretty fast at that age. And I, and I said, you know, hey, I've had, I had a broken leg. I had two separated shoulders. I had several concussions. I've had stitches. I've had clamps. I've had all this other stuff. And all of us have. It's not just like I'm un unique. Why? Because we live in the world. It wasn't the devil. Now, the devil would like to take the credit yeah. for it. Yeah. But I'm still here. God has kept us. God, the devil wants to use things to make you think he has power yeah. when the only power he has is you getting into fear. Yeah. Right. That is it. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. He wants to persuade you. See, he's got to destroy your faith because your faith is how you defeat him. So he's got to destroy your faith. Well, what's my faith in? My faith is not in me. If, if that starts being about me, I'm already whipped. Because I know I'm, I'm a, I fail. So my faith has to be in Jesus. And i got to have confidence that Jesus is not going to turn his back on me. That he's not going to give up on me. Right? So I have to keep my faith there. So he wants to destroy my faith. So that he can persuade me to back down from whatever my profession of faith might be. Yes. Right? If I'm saying he's going to be healed, he's going to say, and I promise you this is what he does. I've had, I prayed, I spent days in my brother's uh, hospital room praying for him when he was totally out of it, dead. I mean, he was dead. And uh, believing for a resurrection. When it didn't happen, the devil said, well, see, there you go. Yeah. He does the same thing. He does. He, the first thing he said when when I prayed for when we uh, at our house praying for Colt before uh, we had any other information other than it was a bad that, it, that they thought it was broke. When we found out then it was broke and how severely it was broken and so on and so forth. Immediately the first thing the devil comes is oh this is really bad. Yeah. And not only does he say that but he says well what's the point about praying for this because you already prayed that it wasn't broken and it is broken. Yeah. So your prayers obviously aren't too powerful. That's, is it, that's what he does. Yeah. Yes. You know, you, you didn't get the victory, so now just give up altogether. Quit doing this. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why would he do that unless this was a threat to him? Right. Exactly. He knows we have power. He knows we have authority. Yes. He knows that we can dominate every yes. circumstance and situation yes. if we will stay focused on who we are in Christ and what authority we have. Yes. We are his espoused. We are. I can write a check on his account any time and I'm not overloading myself because I don't have to fulfill it. I don't have to make sure the funds are there. It's not ever going to come up insufficient because there's more than enough. It's exceeding abundantly above anything I can write a check on. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He wants to make you a doubter. He wants to make you an unbeliever. Sarah? Go ahead. Sure. Something just like totally makes sense for me. So um, I was kind of focused on that word faith, but um, I, I just I went back and I looked at the word conquered. So from like John 5 4, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. Yeah. So we're born of God, we're of his royal family, we conquer the world. So how are we conquering the world? We are conquering the world 
through our faith. Because that is, you know, it's this crazy thing that we exhibit that it doesn't make sense to unbelievers, right? But the other cool thing about that is um, faith, when I've always heard that word faith, I've thought of it as an action. Mm-hmm. But it's not. It's actually a noun. So I really found that really, really, really interesting. It's a noun of the feminine form. Right. I don't have to put the point that I have to you. So um, faith is like, and this is the only way that I can like understand it, but faith is like God's warranty certifying that the revelation that he in birth in us will come to pass. Exactly. I thought that was so cool. Yeah. It's a really neat way to really understand what that word faith means because people are like, oh, you just need to have faith. Mm-hmm. Oh, just be in faith. Well, I don't, I don't really understand what that means. I don't know how to be in faith. I don't understand this action. Well, that's why it never made sense to me because it's not an action. It's, it's a thing. It's a tangible thing that we have. Um, and and that's why, you know, when, and I don't know, maybe it's because I'm very young in all of this, but, you know, faith can move mountains. That doesn't make sense to me. How does that, how is that even possible? Well, it makes sense to me now because, you know, of the explanation that it's God's warranty. That what he put in us is going to happen. It is yes. going to come to pass. Yes. It's faith in him. Yes. Right. It's, it's, and actually the simpler way to say it is, Believe in the finished works. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to deal with all the faith stuff and what is and what isn't. How much have I got? Have I got enough? If you can believe, all things are possible. I don't understand anything. Well, I do a little bit, but I don't understand a whole lot about. Well, I, I'll tell you this. I don't understand anything about air conditioning. But I don't have a problem flipping the switch back there and dialing it down to 68 in the summertime or, or heat and turning it up to 70 in the wintertime. I don't. I don't care that I don't know. Yeah. I just know that it works. Yeah. Right? right? And that's what that's how we deal with Jesus. It isn't yeah. I don't need to understand all the theology. Right. It's good. It helps sometimes, but I even when I don't, yeah. a child can come yeah. to the conclusion yeah. that Jesus is Lord. Right. Amen. My granddaughter believed for a baby sister when they weren't supposed to be having any kids. They got the baby sister who's now 6 months old practically. Yeah. Because she just prayed and believed that that's what Jesus does. Yes. Amen. Isaiah 54, verse 17. So Satan comes and he, he uses words. He uses the law. He tries to get us into unbelief. He tries to get us to doubt. Amen. What the word of God says. What Jesus has promised. Amen. So no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Every tongue that rises against you in judgment... Condemnation, right? You condemn. You're the one that does it. Praise the Lord. You have that authority. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. The other uh, translation is children or children of God. Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. So he tells us the whole story right here in this one little scripture. You have authority. With your mouth, you can shut the devil up. Amen. You can stop him from bringing condemnation and judgment against you by this right here. Amen. This is your inheritance. This is your heritage. This is what you have a right to because you are righteous and your righteousness isn't based on you. It's God's righteousness that has been given to you. So the devil has got no way of fighting against this. Just take it to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. Read on. Let's go to... uh, Chapter 55, next chapter, and verses 1 through 3. Ho! Wake up, everybody. Everyone that's thirsty, come to the waters. He that hath no money. What did he say? Out of of Jesus is the living water, right? And he said, I'll come to you, and then out of you, out of your belly will flow, or out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Everybody that's thirsty, and you got no way of buying it. You don't have the purchasing power to get what it is you need, right? Come, buy and eat anyway. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without a price. In other words, it's free. Yes. Amen. Wherefore, do you, why do you spend money? Why are you paying for something that is not bread, that isn't beneficial, that doesn't give life? Amen? 
And why labor? Why work for that which doesn't give you any satisfaction? Right. Listen. Listen closely to me. And eat that which is good. Yes. And let your soul delight itself in fatness. Yes. Incline your ear. Come unto me. Hear. Heed. Obey. Listen to. Respond in a positive way. And your soul shall live. And I'll make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. You don't have to look very far in David's life to see there was a lot of mercy. Even when he was under the law. We're not under the law. How much greater the mercies that God wants to give to us. This is prophetic, speaking of the Messiah. That's what Isaiah was all about. Amen. So he's saying, today, eat the hidden manna. Amen. Eat Jesus. Eat, eat. Feed on Him. Amen. Don't look to the judgment seat. Look to the mercy seat. Yes. Enter into the rest of Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes. Amen. So we, we, we talked about, I'm, I'm just about done here. A couple of scriptures and we'll wrap it up. But we talked about Jesus being the type for all of the instruments and all of the things that are in the temple. Literally, the temple itself. He was the prototype. He was the pattern from which Moses built the tabernacle here on earth in a physical way. He drew from all the spiritual truths that he saw on Mount Sinai when God gave him the, the vision, the revelation. Amen. So Jesus is the temple, the heavenly temple that Moses built from. The, he's the blueprint, you might say. All right. All right. So Hebrews chapter 1, again, verses 1 through 3. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. That's why all of this that he's talking about when he says, Hey, know you not, you are the temple of God. What is he saying? You're Jesus. You're the reality of what Moses saw in heaven on earth. This is your identity. Just as Christ was the temple, now you've become the temple. God, who at sundry times and in divers' manners spake in these time past unto the fathers by the prophets. That's how he dealt with the Old Testament people. Why? Because they didn't have any faith. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. They didn't operate in faith. They had to operate strictly by intellect, by what they could perceive and understand, unless the Holy Spirit moved upon them and gave them a revelation or gave them a vision or what have you. So he said in the, time, in the past, it was all about just listen to what I'm saying and do it. But he said in these last days, this generation, the Jesus generation, everybody from him forward or beyond, has in these last days spoken unto us by Jesus, by a revelation of Jesus is how He speaks to us. Yes. Whom He has appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds. Yeah. Who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, set yes. down on the right hand of the yes. majesty on high. Yes. Yeah. All right? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. This will be the last scripture. Hebrews, or excuse me, Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 10. Show, I'm showing you what, maybe you haven't missed it, but I missed it. I'm, I've always seen Jesus, me. Me that's all screwed up, but Jesus that's just good, good hearted and, and accepts me. That is not the picture that God's trying to present. The picture is, see me, see Jesus. Paul said, when I look, I want to see nothing but Christ and Him crucified. He's trying to get that into his soul realm as well. He's trying to get to the depth of this thing and understand what it is that's really going on and haven't attained yet. But I know, I press toward the mark of what? The high calling of God in Christ Jesus. For me, not... Not for me to be sinless or spotless or never make a mistake, but for me to come to that understanding and that reality and that revelation that I am as much in God, in Christ, as Jesus is or as Jesus ever was. So, but God, who is rich in mercy for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, made us alive with Christ. Not separate, but in Christ. By grace, you're saved. You didn't have nothing to do with it. That's right. And has raised us up together. Mm -hmm. Not him and me, but together as one. He's raised us up. I was crucified with him in Christ. I was raised 
in Christ, with Christ. Amen. Dead, amen, to my trespasses and sins, right? Dead to the law. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There isn't a real long bench next to the seat that Jesus is sitting in for all of us to be seated in. We are all seated at the right hand of God in Christ Jesus. Just as we don't have to go up there to bring him down because he's already here. He's already here. Praise the Lord. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. We are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus. Unto good works. His works. Which God before ordained that we should walk in them. In Christ. See, here's the deal. It's important always to compare spiritual to spiritual when you're reading the Bible. What God is saying in the book of Revelation relative to all the scripture is important. But what's also important in Revelation is from where he's speaking. Amen. Where he is when he says it and where he is when he does it. Almost everything God says and does in Revelation, he says and does out of a people. Out of his temple. Yeah. Out of the tabernacle of God. Yeah. And Revelation even says the tabernacle of God is with men. You are the temple of God. Praise the Lord. That temple that Moses drew all the spiritual or, or natural building process to show the revelation of Jesus. We are that temple that shows the revelation, that shows the reality of Christ. It's just as spiritual, but it has to be seen through spiritual eyes. We have to deal with it by the Spirit. Because your flesh will keep it just a building. It'll keep it just this. And that will keep you in bondage. This is to cause us to come in to rest. He is the rest wherewith the weary find rest. So when we understand this concept of us and Him, one, that we are this temple, we are this spiritual reality or fulfillment of everything that he's trying to show throughout the word of God. We look here, we look not to find Nathan, but to find Jesus. When I find Jesus, I'll find Nathan. Yeah. Right. When we understand that, his glory will fill the temple. That's what we're after. I, I don't care about the debates I don't care about people trying to fix my theology. I'm not interested. I've already been down that route. I've been there too many times. I'm going to trust God to reveal it to me. Yep. And that's what I'm going to act on. That's it. That's all I'm trying to present. Yep. And you all have a brain and, you know, a spirit. You can search the scriptures for yourself and see if it isn't what God is actually saying. Right. But we've, we've been held captive to such BS for so long. Yes that it just irritates the life out of me. I, I'm not interested in learning any more about somebody with 666 planted on his head because I've already got a name, yes. amen, given to me, and the 666 is not a threat to me. I'm not fearful of it. I'm not worried about uh, flying locusts the size of Volkswagen vans or something coming after me. I'm not worried about any of it. And as Don said earlier, if, if this is about... Uh, a hard times coming? Hey, I've lived through some hard times. I'm almost 70 years old. I've seen some hard times, believe me. Most of my own making, but I mean, I still had them. But here I am. God kept me. No matter what my focus was or my, my feeling or my attention. And he's, he's more than capable of doing it now. And he will. 
if I keep him as the focus, if I keep my eyes on him, if I'm eating that hidden manna instead of all the idle food, I'll stay single minded. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think it's I think it's just what we what we were talking about too is it's it's a further understanding. So some people are getting saved, but they don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, in other words, in speaking in tongues and so on and so forth. Well, it isn't like they don't have the Holy Spirit. If they're saved, they must have the Holy Spirit, otherwise they wouldn't be saved. They just don't speak in tongues because they haven't any revelation of it, because they're not taught anything. But that's my point is this. This is not about us, you know, necessarily trying to figure everything out in an intellectual way. It's about understanding that this, whatever was given in the intellectually, which is what you're talking about to Israel, because they had no faith, they couldn't, they couldn't develop the Holy Spirit, couldn't develop anything in them. But what the Holy Spirit is doing is revealing to us those spiritual realities that are based on physical function. And so when we read the scripture, if we're only reading it and then trying to get some mental understanding or, or, or intellectual value from it, we're missing the whole point because that's what they already had. That's what Moses had. That's what all of the Old Testament was about. And what did it bring them to? It bring them to trusting in things that God was not tr giving them to trust in. They were trusting in themselves. What if the Holy Spirit is faith? That's my point. Of the well, I, I don't. I think we can't. I don't think you can define it as a thing. I don't think you can define the Holy Spirit as being. I mean, is God is love? Certainly, He is love, but He's not just love. Well, no, I'm not trying to limit it. No, I, but I'm not saying it isn't. The Holy Spirit is obviously faith in the sense that the Holy Spirit had to move on people under the old covenant for them to understand anything that God was trying to give them. So when there was revelation, whenever there was prophecy, whenever there was anything that was uh, based on something outside of themselves, it came by the Spirit, and as you say, faith, then made that possible. They, they believed that this was God, and so they acted on it. But again, I, I think it's we can get to the place where we... we, we Complicate things is what I'm saying. I'm trying to simplify it as much as I possibly can and just say, ultimately, we are Christ. That's the picture. That's the whole thing that he's trying to get across to us from Genesis all the way through. The picture of Adam being created in the image of God and then because of intellect, he becomes separated from God. I'm not saying we should be stupid. I'm just saying that the knowledge of good and evil is what separated him from the truth of who he was already in Christ. And that's what I'm after. That's what I'm interested in. I'm, I've, I've had all the theology, I've had all the doctrinal teachings from different denominations and stuff that I can literally swallow anymore. 
So I'm not trying to, I'm trying to get past that, amen, to a revelation of Jesus. And however he wants to reveal himself to me is good, is all right with me. But I want to be that. I'm less interested in understanding as I am in being. Because I, I got to tell you, I thought I understood. I had some revelation and I thought I had an understanding. I've only found out in the last 30 years that the only revelation I had was that I didn't know very much. And God was trying to reveal more to me. And that's the quest that I'm on. That's the, the, the journey that I believe God wants all of us to pursue is Him. He is the revelation. He's the end all and the be all, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, and everything in the middle. And what he wants us to do is identify with that reality. Because again, until it becomes personal, until it becomes me, I'm just a voyeur. Like Eric said, I'm trying to work something up. I'm trying to make something happen that I can't make happen. But if I get to the place where I am one with Him, where I identify totally with Him, the stuff does just happen. Paul didn't have to lay hands on him. And, and, and again, I'm, not, I'm, you know, I'm grateful for what I got from the past that I've lived. The churches I've attended, the, the ministry that I've set in. But I'm just saying it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't everything God was. God was just trying to take us further and further and further. And sometimes you can't get from... A to D without B, C, you know? Right. You can't just make the leap. You, sometimes you got to take the path. you got to go that journey, and it has to be yours. I, I Look, here's the other thing, and then I'll quit. See, revelation is such that it's personal. Right. Absolutely. So we can sit here and say, okay, I get this, and I understand what they said, and I understand what he said, and I understand. But I know that's not the case. Because I'll hear somebody else then say to me a week later something that I'm thinking, oh, wait a minute, we, how many times have we talked about this? Or six months, somebody will stand up and say, I want to share something, and I'm good, praise the Lord, and they'll say something, and I'll, and I, and, and I'll think, really? Like, you didn't know that? I mean, I thought you knew that. But you see what I'm saying? That's not to belittle them because it happens to me. I'm sitting here and somebody, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, well, this is where, and then somebody shares something and go, okay, that's what that is. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with, with what Eric's saying. What I'm saying is I'm, I'm not, that's not my, my goal is not to try to define as much as it is to, uh, you know, I don't know what the word is, but to, to come into who I am in Christ. That's, that's the purpose. That's, that's what Jesus found. What He found was, I and my Father are one. And the result of that was everything. So what He's trying to reveal to us is, we and He are one. And we've made it, we've said it, we've got the, you know, we've got the verbiage down. The problem is, the understanding of that is not settled. It's not seated in us because we're still, as I was saying, we're still see. Yes, I and the Father are one. But, he, you know, it's like we're really close. We're getting closer, but we're... No, we're, you're one. You cannot separate this. Because, here's, what I, here's my point. When it's all said and done, what happens? Read it. He says, us in Christ, Christ in God, all come unto God. All become God. All become God. Not separate, but God. We all are a part of God. We are all this reality of God through eternity. Yeah. That's the thing that shows the goodness and the glory and the mercy and the grace and, 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 and the favor of God that shows throughout eternity God is not selfish. Right. He wants to be revealed. He wants to be experienced. He wants the whole universe to have a physical connection with the Spirit, with God. Praise the Lord. That's what I'm after. And I don't want to, I don't think I gotta to die to see it. No. I didn't, I didn't mean to take away anything you said or have a different theology. I'm just saying so many times I think that, you know, this is my revelation, I guess I'm sure, but yeah. you know, growing up, you'd see, okay, we gotta go see so and so because they have a lot of faith. 
Yeah. They're a faith healer, faith preacher. Right. But all I'm saying is, if you know, just like you said, we're all one spirit, yeah. right? One faith. And that's the whole thing. It's the spirit of God that's in common between all of us. Right. And so, like you said, as we develop that revelation, and as we develop that relationship, and the spirit can possess more of us, right? Then we have more faith. Mm -hmm. And all I mean is so many times... People can be afraid that, oh, I don't have enough faith, or afraid even when you pray, because spirit, you know, that's what the enemy says. Hey, you don't have enough. Right. But we have the full measure of the spirit when we accepted him in. Yeah. And that's all I'm saying. So no, no I, one I, should be afraid to pray for anybody. It's just not like we have to release anything we have. It's when our words are filled with God's spirit. You know, that's all I'm saying. No, so I get I get what you're saying. Is that, that I, I'm not saying there's a contradiction in what you right, said right. or what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, I'm just what I'm saying is what you're saying is, and and what I'm saying is this: it's it isn't uh, it isn't about faith, and we we make it about things, and and it's not because as you said, which is what I, the point I was struggling to make here to, this morning, we are everything. We are complete. We are all that we'll ever be. We are as much as we can ever expect to be. And the thing that separates us from uh, Jesus is our revelation of that or our understanding of that. He, we are identical to him. That's my point. Uh, the man, I'm talking about the man, filled with the Godhead. That's us. That's who we are. And just as Jesus gets, you know, a glorified body after the resurrection. We'll all have a glorified body. We know all those, all those teachings. But we can be just as much God right here on this earth in a physical body as Jesus was. And we don't have to think it. We just be it. It's, it's just accepting that truth. It's, and this goes to the, the question of, uh, of faith and believing. Sometimes I just say believing simply because faith has this stigma. It, it, just as you're referring to, it has this kind of thought to it that, you know, you got to really be this or be that or have all this kind of stuff going on, whereas belief seems a little more reachable. So They're the know, same thing, basically. We're saying the same thing, but right. that's it. But I mean, even our words transfer, I mean, they reflect our mindset, you know what I mean? So it's almost like we need to, in a way, all of us just to rethink different. Like the Hebrew thing is like, they think so much different because we have three, like, traits sure, so sure. compartmentalize everything. And all I meant is, is we realize, like you said, Jesus was built with the God Spirit beyond all measure to the total fullness. And so that's what He wants for us. He's our model. But I mean, a lot of it's about God's Spirit coming into us, being part of us, to realize our relationship is with God's Spirit. And that same Spirit fills Christ. His Spirit fills us. So, you know, in that way, we are one. Yeah, and I think, too, the, the relation or, or the receiving of it, the understanding of it, is also because we all have different past, different experiences. So we hear differently. Yep. I mean, you can have 10 people sitting listening to the same conversation and get 10 different reports about that conversation, about what was heard, about what yeah. was said. Right? And so that's part of what I'm saying about Revelation. Yeah. It doesn't just happen. It just doesn't fall on us like snow out of the sky. It, it's a process. Right. And that's, again, why it's the word. Hearing the word over and over and over and over, and ultimately it will come to you in the way that you can relate to it, that you can understand it, and then share it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Y'all dismissed in Jesus' name before they bail on me. Praise God. I want to feel like I still have some authority. Yeah. Oh, hey, by the way, you're dismissed after the parking lot.